Hello and welcome to Jaga Vision episode 75. Um, today it's going to be pretty exciting. We're, we're on site here in, uh, in the beautiful Cowichan Valley. Um, you uh, hopefully are watching this from YouTube or Twitch or Facebook where we're broadcasting our show. We're on episode, again, 75, so 75 weeks. We're pretty stoked about that. And uh, this is only the second time where we've had the, the chance to um, uh, have a, a show where we, we, we've set up like this with my guest actually physically here with me. Um, we're uh, being careful here. We're I don't know if this is visible, but yeah, we're, we're we're far apart. We're outside. We're being, we're 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 doing what we what we can. Um, we're going to be drinking some some apple cider today like, together. We're going to be talking about fermentation. Um, and my guest here is Kieran. He's the general manager here at Affinity Cider House, um, and really the 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 fellow who's making it all happen <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to this uh, this this beautiful apple cider. Um, so yeah, um, Kieran. Uh, Thank you for coming on. Happy uh, to be here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah, and I uh, really, really um, had an awesome time uh, coming here a few weeks back uh, with uh, with my wife um, and I. We, we 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 got to share some of our kombucha with you. Um, you were Delicious. kind enough. To, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you were kind enough to show us around your your facility, and we got to to look a little bit at your um, your DIY setup you did there on the pasteurizer which is pretty exciting so mm -hmm. yeah. that was that was really fun but uh, out of curiosity so what you want to tell everybody a little bit about what uh what you do and uh, yeah uh, here at affinity so this is affinity cider house it's the latest addition to the affinity property uh more broadly which people might be familiar with through affinity guest house which has been uh a sort of a um a staple uh, event space in the couch and valley for the last decade or so at this point um so you can still rent for uh, for small vacation stays. Obviously, not the you know big events that we were doing pre-COVID, but uh, that's still here. It's a half nature sanctuary, uh, half property that's in the ALR. So it's also farmland. We've got a small-scale kind of market gardening operation going here, and the cidery that has been in development for the last couple of years and uh, only just now started making sales, kind of going public the last two weeks. So. Two 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 and a half weeks ago that we started actually being able to sell the cider we've been making. So exciting. And yeah. it's been a process, right? If I understand correctly, you were doing some <laughs> research and development. You were visiting yeah. a whole bunch of different apple cideries. Um, you were kind of yeah, yeah. Uh, learning a bit about I, I would love to say that the majority of the process was just us really perfecting our craft and kind of <laughs> crystallizing this vision. Uh, in reality, a lot of it was kind of the regulatory hurdles that you go through trying to do something like this. And, uh, a really interesting area where uh, we're within the Cowichan Valley Regional District. We've got the North Cowichan District on our north side. We've got the reserve uh, to the west there, and then we've got the ocean just on the other side of us. So it, it is an environmentally sensitive area, so you do have to be careful with development, and uh, for sure. there's a lot of permits required for that. It's in the ALR. Uh, we're doing this in sort of a heritage building, so uh, lots of you know, fun engineering reviews and assessments to do before you can Especially you can get being below the floodplain, I can imagine. Being below the yeah. floodplain adds to it, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> but, uh, uh, we're but still working on that, but we've got the manufacturing space here, and um, yeah, if people want to order cider online, they can do so, and you can come up and pick up in person. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to start doing the tours and tastings and kind of the picnic area coming this spring. So uh, really Great. looking forward to that. Okay. Um, hold on one sec. Our mic is a little high. Gonna drop that down a little bit. Okay. Um, so um, okay. No. Awesome. I'm. Um, I uh, one of the things that um, really kind of struck me as super fascinating about what you're doing here, just with apples, is uh, the fact that you have made a commitment to use um kind of community apples and what mm -hmm. you grow and, and that's really unusual right because i i mean i remember a visit we did i think i was telling you about this to uh, an amazing apple cidery in portland yeah and uh and the one of the owners was just saying how normally cider is this this uh you know buying from these big juiceries uh that yeah. uh that collect apples from mega orchards um uh, 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 all over north america and then they freeze and hold on to vats yeah. Of, of, of generally dessert apples and then um, different, you know, you're going for a pH and acidity versus sugar balance and you tell them what you want and then they actually blend it, create it for you and mm -hmm. send it to you and then that's what you ferment and you're not actually working with anything that you've, act but you're actually harvesting these apples. Where you're actually pressing these apples yourself. You're actually yeah. 
Can you tell a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, so that, that kind of uh, method you were talking about that the big cideries can use is, is largely due to the wonders of fruit save, which exists for the sort of American cideries in Washington particularly. They've got that big infrastructure established in the Willamette Valley and, and the kind of interior, uh, which, you know, I, I can't say that if, if we were down there, we wouldn't be doing the same thing. It's very tempting to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, for us, it kind of largely just organically grew out of that initial desire to start a cidery based on the number of apple trees that we had growing around us. Mm. And they're not in a big orchard. It's kind of the, uh, the old trees that are remaining from previous uh, kind of homesteaders, people settling down in the area, planting a tree, forgetting about it, uh, the old properties that got chopped up and subdivided and then overgrown. and. So you're always driving down the side of the road and you'll see trees kind of sitting here or there at the side mm -hmm. or in people's yards kind of forgotten about. And uh, we started thinking about, wouldn't it be cool if we could start uncovering all these older trees that are currently just producing underutilized fruit yeah. and try to do something with that, try to make kind of a, a value added product out of it. And, uh, and it's kind of grown from there. And, and so far we've been able to um, keep on using 100% just those kinds of apples, so all That's stuff so cool. within the Cowichan Valley. Um, and then of course you don't want to take anything too far away because uh, it's hard to justify driving three hours to then spend the day picking a tree and, and drive all the way back here. So I know uh, a, a fairly well established uh, Vancouver Island cidery that uh, I just went in, I saw like orchards and I just assumed everything was from their orchard, but mm -hmm. uh, definitely uh, they said that they put a little bit of their orchard in all of their bottles, but, <laughs> but they're at this yeah. place with, I guess, the demand um, that uh, they couldn't do that anymore, and, yeah. and, and they decided that they were going to bring in Okanagan apples. So it's all Canadian apples, they say, which is, yeah. which is uh, interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it would be interesting to see how this process scales, <laughs> right? Like, it would be really cool That's to see this go into a place where you can, you can, can you maintain this, or is this yeah, just going to yeah. be one bottle that is that and then the rest are you know as you as you grow it something different or uh, but yeah. the vision here is to 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 create something mm -hmm. with what's not being harvested right yeah and i mean it's that that's kind of the really romantic idea that, that we started out with and it we've really found ourselves growing attached to that uh, and kind of building an identity around it so mm -hmm. uh now yeah i think the pressure is on to really try to maintain that mm -hmm. what you mentioned there is a good point though it's really easy to quickly outgrow that mm -hmm. um, and obviously you want to be successful and you want to keep scaling up but at a certain point it does become more difficult to kind of keep finding those trees that are out and around but uh, we do have uh, some orchard space here that uh, there's the, the chance to do some replanting and planting of our own cider apples so I think there's room to grow there. But uh, I, I actually find that really interesting and exciting. Like I, I, I often talk to people about, uh, especially other small business owners, about um, just this idea of, of scaling up and whether or not it's even something that a person wants to do. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. you yeah. can get to a point where you're like, okay, I have a, a good organized system. Everything is kind of doing what it needs for me. I have a, a delicious product. I have people that are really excited about it. I'm paying my bills. Mm -hmm. do I really need to become the next Apple empire? You <laughs> right. know, like, is there, is there yeah. a place, like, do I have, do I have, like, am I, cause capitalism can be fairly cancerous, right? Like it can be this like yeah. absolutely mm -hmm. ever expanding um, thing. And, and it, it can be really helpful yeah. to have sort of these guiding principles that you can hopefully adhere to and stick to because you can still scale up, yeah. but you're kind of falsely limiting yourself in a way it's not really false it's really real because it, it also adds meaning because i think that to continue doing something really long term it needs to be meaningful yeah and and it's very meaningful what you guys are doing you mm -hmm. know rescuing these these apples that are otherwise you know not being utilized um obviously the earth is using them <laughs> it's yeah. great but it, it <laughs> yeah. should it, it's so great to be able to to communicate these flavors to people and and, and, and to yeah. do that so i personally i hope that this is uh you know like there's a way you can yeah. You know, like you were telling me a really cool story um, when we first got here today about yeah, something yeah. you were doing yesterday. You, can you tell the audience a little bit about what you were up to in the? In yeah, absolutely. So uh, just a good example of the, the the sorts of apples that we end up using and, and how we get to them. We've been picking our our neighbor's trees for the last couple of years, and I was over there just the other day asking him if uh, if we could use his fruit again this year, and he was talking to a friend of his who just said. Um, 
oh, hey, I have some apple trees in our yard. You should come and check them out. So I drove over there just uh, up the road here, maybe a couple of kilometers just into the reserve and uh, went out. And sure enough, there were these old apple trees that were a little overgrown, it looked like. So I thought, well, we'll be back next week. We'll bring our weed whacker and the brush cutter blade and we'll, we'll get in there and see if we can open them up. Um, got in there and uh, the more you kind of poke and prod and get in, you start seeing, oh, there's another tree back there. And oh, there's another tree behind that. And so it ended up being there was like nine or, or 11 old apple trees. And when I started talking to the owners, they were telling me that their grandpa had planted those. And we figured they must be about 80 years old at this point That's so cool. on seedling rootstock. So, I mean, one of them was easily 40 feet tall. Uh, wow. So yeah, got like a thousand pounds of, of apples out of there, and and we had missed the majority of them this year. They'd fallen on the ground. But so you could go in next year, and you're like, yeah, okay, yeah. Look at that, my. That's really what we see it as. It's kind of a, a future investment, and um, it kind of ties into this idea of land stewardship as well. You're you're trying to build a relationship with the people and the place, and make sure that it's a beneficial relationship both ways. So we went in there, we spent. Uh, probably two days uh, bushwhacking, getting all the fruit out of there. It didn't make a ton of sense this year, but now we've opened up the space. We paid the people for the fruit, so they got some money out of it. They're, they've got their access to their trees back, and now we hope that they'll be happy enough with that relationship that we'll come back next year in time for the harvest, and we won't have to do as much work, and, and we can kind of get the fruit back. And uh, That's exciting. One of the conversations that came out of that was talking to uh, the, the current um, homeowner there and he expressed a, a desire to really kind of save some of these trees that his grandpa had planted because obviously he's got memories of climbing up in there when he was a kid and there's a real emotional connection there mm. and wanting to take a, a cutting of them and um, it. reroute it, graft it onto another tree, onto another rootstock. Um, and kind of uh, keep on propagating that and, and keep it going because they are cool. you know 80 years old they're, they're getting towards the end of their lifespans potentially so they grew from seed though so there could be mm -hmm. some uh, longer like we just don't know at that point right like if we're not growing yeah. cultivars we're you know it's interesting though because um, th there's a relationship here to um, to to tea where um, you have um, kind of like a, a what they call an arbor varietal where you have the the trees that are harvested from using ladders that are hundreds of years old, hmm. or you can have the um, the cultivars, the cultivated varieties that are propagated using um, clippings yeah. that they put into. So it's similar to the grafting concept of apples versus the seed grown apples. Yeah, and uh, I just find that the, that it's so interesting. Just yesterday we were drinking some green tea that was normally green teas are good for about eight to 15 months. And then you lose, the umami will disintegrate, you get this really sort of unpleasant, um, sort of grassy flavor. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can, if you, with these older ones, we were drinking them, we found a package that was four years old, and we were like, oh, this is gonna be horrible. But we drank it just in case, it was awesome. Hmm. But the big difference between it and what we normally get is that this was from Mandokoro. And Mandokoro is one of the ancient growing sites in Japan, and the farmers that we visited there are growing from seed stock. Uh, they said that when they try and grow cultivars, the two-meter snow that they get in the winter crushes the leaves and they don't regrow. Whereas mm -hmm. the, the, the local heirloom varietals that they, that they have from the seed stock actually gets crushed by the weight of the snow. Yeah. And then when it melts, it springs back up and it's good to go. So mm -hmm. they can only work with that. And yeah, it's actually yeah. so challenging to work on tea in that area that now that, they've, that things have been more mechanized, etc., they don't, you know, it's so much easier to not do what you're doing, I guess is the connection. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. like, to grow uh, an orchard, mm -hmm. to put the cultivars that you want grafted onto uh, dwarf stock, yeah, um, yeah. to make that process uh, streamlined, etc., cetera, um, is, is, is very much, I think, where larger scale goes. And this yeah, happens yeah. in T too. Yeah. I want, I get these nice small hedges, um, but it's just so interesting to me the different dynamics and the different flavors that come out of it. And there's actually quite a following in tea for, again, what they call arbor varietals. Mm. So this idea of having a tree. And you could actually probably do that. You could probably do single tree apple cider. Wouldn't that be the yeah, coolest yeah. thing? And you could actually have it so connected to that place. Yeah, yeah. If you're getting a thousand pounds out of like you know, it doesn't even have to be single tree, it could be single yard. You could just yeah, have yeah. a yard and that created like a whole batch. Yeah. And and you could you could celebrate that. If it makes I don't know, you know, you gotta mix it. I've got a carboy back there that we'll try later that is exactly what you're talking about. So that's so <laughs> cool. You know, we did we actually we were talking to the honey farmer that we use for uh, the fermentation in our kombucha. Yep. And we were like, you know, could we do this with honey? And we actually said he said sure. And so we actually got it where he had some beehives in a particular what they call a yard in beekeeping. And we call it single yard. 
and we got the the geographic uh like the the latitude and longitude coordinates oh, we nice. got the variety of the bee that he was using in that area yeah we got like all that stuff and, and and it was so different from you know normally what he does is he takes all of his honey and he separates it by color so particular colors become fireweed or blackberry or what have you because mm -hmm. they know that from experience what's what yeah but ours was all mixed together but it was one yard yeah yeah and it was so interesting that's really so neat so complex yeah, yeah. you yeah. know and it'd be really cool to see see what happens with what you're doing yeah. um, there's just a little bit of a buzzing sound it sounds like with the audio i'm just gonna click the be right back button sure. on here we're gonna go quiet for a moment try and fix the problem and then we'll be uh we'll be right back so just hold on one second please uh people watching okay so be right back okay all right so um hopefully that solves the problem <laughs> Uh, and we've gotten rid of the buzz. Uh, we'll be checking as we go. Okay. Um, but maybe we can drink some of your cider while we're talking. Um, sure. Why not? What do you want to What do you want to start with? Uh, so let's let's go with the the kind of classic, the the traditional, the funky, the scrumpy, the scrumpy. <laughs> we're going scrumpy. Say nice a little fizz on that one. You want to tell our viewers what a scrump a scrumpy uh, so scrump, is in scrumpy, the world of apple the, cider? The word uh, scrumpy comes from uh, the the action of scrumping apples, which uh, in the UK was um basically stealing them from your neighbor without letting them know and uh sort of the the old orchard apples or the, the hedgerow apples jumping over the fence grabbing what you can getting out of there it's associated with kind of a more raw uh flavor profile a lot of times they're cloudy they may or may not be carbonated um you get uh oftentimes i think traditionally they would have been done with a wild yeast so you do get the kind of mix of aromas and esters that produced by the wild yeast there so uh you you get kind of this succession where you start out with the really weak strains that come in the the saccharomyces bianus or the uh cloacera and then those are overtaken by the saccharomyces cerevisiae which are kind of more of uh that that's what all of the yeast that you'd use in a cider or wine are uh today if you get the, the kind of cultured ones mm. um so so interested the, the, in that because doesn't that give you a lower alcohol content because they've they've, they've cultivated these yeasts to produce higher yeah. alcohols when they go through the fermentation well right? you're only ever going to get uh as much alcohol as the sugar can provide so but the, the in, rate in, at which it happens and and where how quickly the yeast die off or if they're capable of finishing the fermentation could have an effect on that Generally, though, with apples as opposed to grapes, the potential for such a high alcohol content isn't there to begin with. So most yeasts are going to be able to take it through to kind of your 6 to your 7% that you might see okay. most most often. Uh, at least that's what we get with these apples. So My stepdad, he's like super into um, firm, uh, fermentation, specifically apple ciders. He grows um, uh, heritage cultivars. He's really mm -hmm. into harvesting crab apples. Um, we often geek out on on this stuff and 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 uh have a lot of fun talking about kind of the more intricate uh parts of uh fermentation mm -hmm. and i've often brought up wild yeast with him and and he's really interested but he was always concerned about spoilage uh how do you yeah. avoid that in your um in it's your a it's a definite concern and uh I, I mean, to be to be honest, technically, you know, I, I'm not sure that this cider would score that well because it is not without the technical faults. Right. A lot of times the esters and things that are produced by yeasts, cheers, cheers. Uh, those are um, those are, are things that give you the aromas of like uh, diacetyl can be like almost like a butter popcorn, okay. which it it is a fault. So it would be you'd get points off of that if you'd sent your cider into glint cap or something. But uh, in a small amount, a lot of people kind of like that sort of thing. Right. Uh, and it, it kind of ties into this whole, the family of aromas that people refer to as barnyard. Mm. So the kind of farmy smells, the, the sort of outdoor grassiness. I'm that, so interested in the, be, the, the uh, Basque region. Uh, yeah. Uh, because they talk a lot about barnyard and going yes. for that and not yeah, going yeah. for the clean cider. And, yeah. and, and, and just for our viewers, just to put this in perspective, um, what we're talking about here. Uh, is again very different from uh, there's a, a norm that's developed in 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 society especially in North America where where apple ciders kind of become synonymous with this um, sort of fizzy alcoholic pop and that idea is mixing alcohols that have nothing to do with the cider in with the cider um, giving it like f uh, fragrances and then selling it as an apple cider but what we're talking about here if in case it's not obvious is um, a different approach this is more of a, a traditional approach there's a reawakening Many people credit North America with uh, cidery in um, in uh, in uh, Portland called Reverend Nats, 
um, that began this. But you know, it's been happening for years. It kind of disappeared during the prohibition. Um, and uh, really, it's this idea of working with apples in a way where, where you're expressing the terroir, the interesting flavors that they have to say in a way that's similar to craft wine. Um, so that's really what we're talking about here mm -hmm. is, 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 is that. And so with, uh, with wine as well, uh, people get really into, you know, th there's a kind of an idea of, of using wild yeast there too. And, and yeah, there's sort of this, this whole natural wines category. And, yeah. and I, I won't talk about wines at all because I, I know very little about them. I, I sort of got interested in fermentation through cider, so I haven't uh, explored too much beyond that. But with this, I do know that, that uh, there's sort of the VA uh, fault that is um, is generally really avoided in wine the the volatile acids and uh, in here that generally comes from the esters that are produced by the yeasts so there there is definite uh, VA here it's it's often that kind of is that characteristic that the Basque region you were talking about is going for where they have like a, a, a distinct vinegar kind of character to it through the acetic acid mm -hmm. and then the esters that usually accompany that so like ethyl acetate that one can be almost like in a, in a large amount that can be uh like acetone like mm -hmm. a nail polish remover yeah yeah so obviously that's going to be undesirable for anybody mm -hmm. but in like a smaller kind of more manageable amount it, it has kind of a really nice floral aroma so interesting um my, my, my brewer uh uh for kombucha jaga silk he often talks about the nail polish remover yeah and uh takes sips and goes i can taste nail polish and I, I don't think I have the palate for it. Um, That's the I, thing, I, right, is everybody's different. So something that is really distinct and pronounced for one person might not be even remotely detectable for another, yeah. uh, which kind of explains the vast array of reactions that different people might have to exactly the same. But the I same find drink, I, I so. really, really enjoy drier ciders. Yeah. You know, yeah, whereas, yeah. Uh, you know, that's not always the case with it with, with all the folks. You have a different cider here, which mm -hmm. I assume when you call it modern dry is just a... Uh, a a way of saying slightly sweeter than the heritage dry, or what's different uh, about it? So the, the it's not a difference in sweetness. It's it's back to the uh, the kind of aromas that you get from the yeast. These are actually made dur during uh, the exact same apples. So the only difference comes from the the different uh, yeasts that ended up taking over, and they were both wild, but uh, just kind of by uh, happenstance, this one ended up taking on a characteristic much closer to what you'd expect with a. Uh, like a cultured uh, yeast that you would buy. Well, that's fascinating. So, so you're actually differentiating based off of what you're mm -hmm. tasting. Yes. Um, generated by the wild yeast that you're cultivating. Yeah. So the, yeah. So the, the yeast heritage. and the fermentation has decide, decided the variety rather, or the the, uh, the type of cider mm -hmm. rather than me having a type of cider in mind and then trying to make that thing specifically. Mm. Um, and, and that, you know, it was also our first year, so it was very easy to do and just say, this is the cider that we have. What do I want to sell this as? Um, if I wanted to try to kind of replicate this, mm. uh, I might have to get a little bit more creative and technical with how we do that in subsequent years. But isn't it cool um, that you can't? Yeah. Or that it's really, I think really hard to do really so? Neat. Yeah. But there's every a, year it's going to be... There's you, a place you in... Um, well, they should have a year on them, hey? You can be there. Yeah, definitely. As I, as I go forwards, I'm going to have to start uh, putting vintages on here because uh, right. it, it's going to have a very different character in, in the future for sure. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm glad to hear that you like it. It's delicious. <laughs> yeah. it's um, And this one is totally dry as well. All of them are totally dry. So uh, there's definitely kind of a, a tartness. I find that it has a little bit of that astringency, not as much as you would expect to find with traditional kind of cider apples mm -hmm. because we do have a real array although a large percentage of them are kind of the dessert table apples that are going to have uh, much higher acidity, sort of a, a medium to high sugar content, and then lower on the tannins, mm. which kind of lends to that tartness, because once the sugar is all gone, to not mask any of that, it really kind of exposes the acidity that was that was there That's from the start. What, what, what role do uh, your, your choices in apples play in that end flavor like you're, you're obviously mm -hmm. choosing certain apples for certain characteristics you mentioned dessert apples and again yeah. for those watching their dessert apples are generally sweeter meant for eating uh heritage apples often um cider apples often taste really bad but ferment really good yeah they call um, them spitters yeah. for, for a reason <laughs> <laughs> so in in tea uh the probably the most ubiquitous cultivar in, in in tea production for for um say matcha or japanese teas is is yabukita mm -hmm. is there like a a cider apple that is like the sort of the, the, the ultimate cider it, apple? And if so, um, do you have access to it? Do you use it? Um, uh, yeah, it, it depends. Um, 
generally speaking, uh, a good cider is, is going to be from a blend of different apples. So apples, they class them kind of, uh, in all apples, there's the classes that you were talking about. You've got the table apples. So that's one that's kind of been selected and for the, the eating, the fresh eating taste. So uh, you want sweetness, you want kind of a nice crisp texture, you want good size, something that's not gonna blemish very readily. Uh, sort of a nice tartness and then you get the different flavor varieties uh, that, that you'd find you know between a Fuji or a Granny Smith or something and then you've got the culinary apples which are going to be selected they generally for the ability to kind of retain the flavor through cooking and also retain the uh, the structure too so they don't just kind of fall apart and go to mush on you mm. and then the cider apples uh, those ones really only have a use for making cider they're they're not very nice to eat you can't really cook with them the size is not going to be great. They often are not the prettiest looking apples. They might be kind of gnarly looking, uh, very russeted skin that looks almost like a potato sometimes. Mm. Um, and those ones, typically in the UK, they were classified according to their level of acidity and their level of tannin. Mm. So the acidity obviously is fairly straightforward. That's kind of that, that tartness, the sourness has an effect on the pH, which can matter in fermentation. Right. And then the tannins, it, it's sort of an informal classification of, of chemical compounds that it, I think technically it just means anything that tans. Um, but it's, 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 <laughs> it's the, yeah, yeah. So, well, and that's, that's, a good, tannin, that's, that, that's a good uh, descriptor too, because people might not be familiar with, well, what is a tannin? What does that taste like? Is it sweet? Is it sour? It's more of that kind of sensation of mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. And a tea is a, a good example of sort of a nice soft astringency mm -hmm. that you get, the kind of mouth drying or like a, a very thick, full-bodied red wine. I um, often say when it's too intense, it's like you've licked sandpaper. Yes, yeah, yeah. that really dries your mouth out. And yeah. that, that depends on the, the actual size of the, the polymer. So there's monomers and there's dimers and the smaller the size, the more bitter the tannin, and the longer it is, the kind of softer it's going to be. Oh, interesting. Which is why you would age something like that, is so those small, right. smaller molecules can bind together and polymerize, and then that creates that softer, more pleasant, astringent sensation. There's a, um, uh, when you, tea goes through a process called enzymatic oxidation. So it's rather than a fermentation, you're taking the polyphenol oxidase enzyme, and you're uh, you're allowing it to wither the leaves, mm, and when yeah. you do this, there especially when you uh, massage them and beat them up, like you see happen in, in, in tea production, there's a there's a, a crushing of the cell walls that achieves just what you're talking about. There's a right. there's a that's why crimson teas often taste a little bit maltier or basier because they're 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 making that that tannin a little mm. bit more subdued interesting um, via this process. So, right, right, yeah. And no. so with with the cider apples that's kind of the the defining characteristic of a cider apple that you're not going to find and that's why they're really only good for for cider is because of the tannin in them and the terroir so. plays a huge role too right like there's a they talk about it in a lot of cider books that yeah, i've read yeah. about being near the ocean you know that seems to be yeah. like a coveted uh, yeah, yeah. thing and and so it's it's really cool that you're you're you know here on vancouver island mm -hmm. um but in the Cowichan valley where you're located you're you're near uh, this kind of the sea breeze and yeah. and it, it, it probably does a lot for for linking you to uh, the, it, it the worldwide can, yeah. understanding of what I, makes I think, a good cider growing region. Yeah, I think definitely. Um, I, I mean, the there's really conflicting opinions about the whole idea of terroir and wine, whether or not it's kind of overblown or sure. or not. But sure. I mean, in the end, in the end, I think that the fact that it makes a good story and really does tie a place to a region and create more of an identity is important not just in the business of it but actually in the way that you perceive and taste things because taste taste is not an objective thing it happens in the subjective. brain it's influenced by you person know where you are how you're feeling on the day mm -hmm. it the story that is told about something as you're drinking it does have an impact on your perception of it and the, the overall experience right you know, i had a um i often tell the story at the end of training sessions when i'm doing training is is just uh Apparently there was this study where they hooked up these flavor uh, 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 judges um, for wine to, mm -hmm. they hooked up their brains to um, the machines that would measure the enjoyment level yeah, of yeah. what they were drinking. But the judges thought that they were being asked, you know, their opinion on things. And obviously they were aware there was a test going on, but they were handed a red wine, told that it's Joe's red wine, a no year, yeah. over, you know, just picked up at the local gas station in the United States. And... They just were told to drink it. They thought it was pretty good. Is yeah. what the people and they tasted it. And they're like, yeah, that's actually really good. A little blip in their brain. Um, uh, for the pleasure center, they were then handed another red wine. They said, this is uh, you know 
one gold medal, it's from this elevation, this soil structure, this is the fellow who grew it, this is, you know, uh, all of this information, and they drank it, and pleasure centers through the roof, <laughs> yeah, through the roof, yeah, and it yeah. was the same wine. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of people would take that to mean, oh, these guys don't know what they're doing. No, the but it's just that blown, but placebo it... and the, 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 the story and the understanding we yeah. have what we're drinking mm -hmm. actually um, imparts a very physical yeah. response. It's, it's a real thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's really fascinating. Have you ever considered um, doing single cultivar or single tree so uh, we were just talking about that yeah. but like with with a with a cider apple yeah but so the to get back to i don't think i ever actually answered it you okay. said there was that one variety or was yeah. there a one variety yeah, that yeah, people yeah. would do and and i said oftentimes people are blending to try to balance acidity and tannin but there are a few trees that are known for being uh for their ability to make a single varietal okay so the the one that uh i mean i'm sure everyone would have a different answer as to what the most popular is but the real classic would be the kingston black okay so that one's from the uk uh i actually have 100 kingston black uh seedlings growing in my nursery right over there which nice. i'm hoping to be able to plant out and and try a bit of that that single varietal stuff very cool they are uh, a very temperamental tree and based on the other growers that i've spoken to on the island especially yeah. and kind of the coast they're they're not easy to grow in this climate Right. So I was just looking at my success rate over there, and, and certainly uh, not everyone has made it. So <laughs> we're going to have to look after the ones that have so far. Aww. But it would be great to, to try to, um, to do something like that, do more of a single varietal. In my experiments with that in the past, mm -hmm. I haven't really found a, an apple that, that uh, feels like it's benefiting from, from being left on its own. Okay. There was one that I made out of a, an apple called a wine sap that uh, somebody had. I, I found they had a small orchard with a couple of them. Very small trees, really small apples, a lot of work to pick. Uh, kind of makes you wonder if it's all worthwhile or not. Right. But um, it has made quite a pleasant cider, I think. And I, I think it needs maybe a little bit longer to age. Sure. But so far, it's looking good. Although, I mean, you have to ask yourself at some point, like, would this be better if I were just focusing on the kind of sensory experience and trying to get the blending really nailed down mm. versus what's the value of having that story of this is a single varietal that has a real kind of a cachet to it that people uh, is, are going to respond to? Again, in tea, uh, this comes up a lot, especially with Japanese teas, where they blend multiple cultivars together. That mm -hmm. is by far the norm. Yeah. Um, you blend for the same reason. You, these, this cultivar gives you color, aromatics. This cultivar gives you a little bit of tannin. This one gives you some umami, brings out that rich depth, you know, and you'll sometimes have like five, six, 13 different uh, selections that are all blended together to just get that ideal. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have these tasters, they have their like black belt and tasting and they're, they're, they're deciding on h how that looks at that particular moment so that yeah. they can achieve a very consistent flavor profile from year to year. And then when you as a consumer go and buy the tea, it's given a poetic title. It's been blended by what they call an otsaya or a tea company, who's mm -hmm. in turn bought those selections from a co-op that the farmers sell to. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's this interesting, but but I think it's so interesting to to have the the what what uh, you and I, my wife and I do is we love to get these single cultivars and, and, and talk about them, even though we do love the blends. Like I, I actually brought some with me to share it with you uh, later. A samidori blend, fantastic, competition grade. Mm. But uh, there's also this okumidori single cultivar by this farmer in Kyoto, and it noticeably has flavor holes yeah but it's awesome i love that it's different because i <laughs> yeah. think you can get to a place where by blending and making that perfect ideal flavor you start to lose the identity of what it is that you're you know like mm -hmm. it's actually good to have flaws it's yeah. good to have holes and i think it makes it more interesting more memorable yeah um i think that, that there's a place for that and mm -hmm. I, I, I and there is also a place for that perfect yeah, yeah. tea or that perfect cider you know so I, I think you can i think you can have your your, mm -hmm. your, your cake and eat it, it would be nice to, to be able to do both uh, a lot of the ciders that I try when I go around and I try other people's ciders I, I tend to gravitate towards oh what is your your driest kind of purest yeah. single apple yeah. cider which might not necessarily be the first one they want to share with you because it it's generally it's not going to be their most popular or their best seller and right. it might not even be the one that they're the most proud of right. so uh, I mean I'm just kind of looking at it because I'm looking for those direct comparisons to what I've been doing to mm -hmm. kind of see how it is but a lot of them uh they end up tasting a little bit similar because they're they're generally they're free of any fault right. 
So you get the kind of very soft floral aromas. You get the apple You don't have any of the other kind of really strong or funky esters going on in there. Mm. We're, for the most part, using pretty similar fruit in this area uh, because we do have a very limited supply of cider apples. So if they're using kind of remotely similar stuff to we are, a blend of those table and dessert apples and maybe some crabs, it, it does end up being very kind of samey. Right. So I think that's one of the reasons Great why work. you see so many people, uh, <laughs> why you see so many people looking for differentiation by getting into kind of more exotic blends, flavoring, mixing with other fruits yeah. and things, and uh, I really like that. And and there's another cidery in the valley here that that is doing primarily that, and they're doing a great job. And they're still dry. They're still really complex. They're still made from kind of local fruit. They're they're long fermented. They're aged well. Um, it's, uh, it's a really neat thing and it's a segment of the market that's expanding because a lot of people would associate that with kind of more of a malt liquor, like a Mike's hard lemonade that's yeah. flavored. They think it's like, oh, it's flavored. You put a syrup in, but I mean, it's, it's the same kind of natural fermentations and, and the same chemistry that's going on with an apple cider or yeah. with a white wine or something. They're just using more of a variety of fruit in it. So well, Perry's uh, and you know, like your, your pear mm -hmm. ciders are, are yeah. uh, have also, they have their traditional following and they're supposed to be when Certainly. done well, yeah, like mind blowing. So, yeah. And I, yeah. that's one thing that's, that's uh, sort of my, my white whale right now is to find a really good traditionally made Perry with, with Perry pears. Um, yeah, that would be so because they're so hard to find. Right? I mean, cider yeah. apples are hard to find here. Like we cut them all down during prohibition, but right. Perry pears are even harder to find, right. uh, especially in Canada. So would mm. really love to try one of those because you're right. People say that um, a fine Perry is like really unrivaled. It's like it's like the top kind of echelons of champagnes and yeah, white so wines. Interesting. Um, uh, uh, we don't have a whole lot of time left, but um, uh, just as a as a, a question that I'm super curious about is just uh, you've chosen to um, uh, like I'm I'm a sucker for natural carbonation. Mm -hmm. um, and you've decided to force carbonate, which I've always, when mm -hmm. I look at it, I'm like, hmm, why would a person force carbonate? <laughs> but I understand about shelf stability. Yeah. Um, but is there a flavor component? Uh, what is the reason that you pasteurize and, 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 and shelf carbonate? Is there mm -hmm. a, a desire to try doing uh, a cider that doesn't do that? What are your thoughts on that process? Yeah. I'm um, really interested in this, this part of what you do. I, I don't um, place a huge amount of, of uh, value on, on trying to kind of uh, stay away from using a more industrial process uh, just for the sake of kind of keeping the kind of idea of natural and authentic. I think if, it, if you're able to maintain the character that you're going for mm -hmm. using a more efficient method, um, why then, then why not? I definitely would like to do more of a sort of a pet nat. The, uh, primarily the reason that we ended up force carbonating is because... Um, I, I just missed my window to do it. Like you want to kind of catch the cider before it's finished fermenting. Right. When, uh, when it's, it's still got a little bit of residual sugar, you bottle it at that point, you let it kind of finish fermenting in the bottle, or you can back sweeten later, but the timing didn't really work out. I didn't have my fresh juice available and I didn't want to just use uh, sucrose or glucose to, to back sweeten, which is very popular in, in uh, kind of home brewing and cider making. Mm -hmm. um, and, and at that point it had already kind of clarified itself naturally. So I thought, well, I've got this beautiful natural clarification. I could back sweeten now, but it's going to kind of re-cloud. And then if you bottle at that point, you end up with kind of sediment dropping out if you're not sure mm -hmm. how long it's going to be sitting on someone's shelf. So once we, I mean, now that we've what been able to start selling and we, we've got more of a consistent methodology, uh, I would like to start adding in these, these different varieties there. But I just kind of wanted to, to have the flexibility of, of being able to uh, carbonate it at this point uh, pasteurize it so that I know it's going to stay stable at that point and, and then at least I've got a pretty good idea of what the consumer is going to experience right you know that that's going to be fairly close to, to the way that I've packaged it fair fair I'm I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, yeah because I'm so like I would love to I just love everything about your processes mm -hmm. your your way that you're interacting with the cider the the, the local harvest the wild yeast the the 
the just everything done in house, and that was just the only part where I was like, huh, you know, like I yeah, wonder yeah. if there could be uh, uh, like a special series that wasn't that, yeah. um, or if it's just that is like part of what mm -hmm. you what you're searching for. Yeah, and, it, it and was the, honestly it was just yeah, an added yeah, variable that I I wasn't comfortable throwing into the mix yeah, because fair. it's like yeah, like it's, you you don't want to do too many different things. At a thousand once. bottles explode <laughs> if something goes wrong. You don't know yeah. where it happens. So yeah, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> then um, uh, sediment. Yes. Um, so in, we were actually just talking about this this morning with my team at, at, at Jagasilk. Uh, I was explaining to them that when they're serving, um, uh, we have a Dafo Longjing on our menu right now. It's a beautiful green tea. It's parched. Uh, but when they serve it, if, if it has sediment in it, it's actually a sign from uh, my understanding, at least of, of, of sort of how that should look, mm -hmm. is you shouldn't see sediment in the cup. So when you do your extraction, I told them that, that we need to put it through. A, we have these super fine sieves that are meant for catching plankton. Mm -hmm. and we can't, really, ideally, it wouldn't be in the tea in the first place. It would have been sorted well enough yeah. that you wouldn't see that, right? Yeah. Um, but with Japanese green teas, that's less of an issue. They're actually totally fine with having a bit of sediment in the cup. It actually adds body. To filter it all out actually um, is not the correct thing to do. Mm -hmm. So it, it, you see this with the natural wines where there's actually... Uh, sediment becomes something that's acceptable yes um yeah, yeah. have you considered just being okay with sediment in your ciders or is that is that something mm -hmm. that, that you that would it, what why why are we af why are we afraid of, of sediment in ciders? yeah i don't I, know i think so. i think it, it is largely just um what people have gotten used to so cultural uh, i think i think largely cultural because you do see uh kind of a distinction there between the north american and the the english market okay. in terms of what people are looking for that kind of really crystal clear cider i think uh, is more that's more associated with kind of the modern ciders mm. um, I mean as we were mentioning earlier when we talked about the scrumpy one of the factors that people would consider uh, making a scrumpy a scrumpy is the kind of cloudiness that that sort of it looks unfinished a little bit mm. but I think there's it also depends on what that cloudiness is coming from um, obviously when you fresh press apple juice it's kind of this thick brown opaque liquid uh, and that's just uh, little chunks of fruit that are sitting in there. Mm -hmm. If you end up with a haze coming from the pectin in there, that's a little different. It's going to be much more stable that way. It's going to stay hazy and you won't end up with a sediment. Oh, if you don't have a ton of pectin in there or if you've depectinated it with a, uh, an, an enzyme that a lot of people use at the start, then you're going to get those kind of apple-y, the fruit chunks, the microscopic little bits of fruit. Those will fall out and form a sediment. But mm. that, that's the kind of stuff that wouldn't bother me. Mm -hmm. And I don't think from a sensory perspective it's going to have a difference. Okay. If you end up with uh, yeast cells that are still suspended in the solution and then those drop out, then your sediment is going to be very yeasty. So there will definitely be a, a, a different kind of bready, yeasty component to the stuff as people continue to pour off even further. Or if you end up with a film yeast that kind of forms on the surface there and then that, that ends up breaking off and settling down at the bottom as well. Mm. So there, there's different ways that a cloudiness or a sediment could come about, um, and uh, it really depends on, on you know what the consumer is expecting and then what kind of a, an additional character you're worried about imparting to the to the cider or or somebody's experience. Because you don't filter, right? Like you like I, I remember visiting a, a cidery that had like a had a whole contraption in place, um, uh, and it was uh, it was kind of. Um, what they'd done is they'd, they'd pass it through a channel that had paper filters built in, almost like coffee filters, mm -hmm. and then it removed all of the, it removed all of like the yeasty bits or I guess any of that stuff. Yeah. Um, but I always found that even in coffee, when I drink a coffee, I, I, I don't like to use paper filters because I believe it m removes the oils and it's the volatile oils that gives you such interesting flavors. And I, oh, yeah. I know that there's this component of it where it's like, oh, it's cleaner, it hits your palate better, you can taste more, but mm -hmm. I really believe that those fats, those, 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 those solids, um, are a contributor rather than a taker away or right um, and and so I've always been and so you don't but you just your process is just using temperature control and racking right is that yeah and it's it is naturally clarified in our case just due to the amount of time that that was taken and again I, I mean we we had intended to start serving the cider earlier uh, but we ended up kind of being delayed by an entire season a whole year because of the, the kind of regulatory situation we were in so it may not have been uh, as clear to begin with as it is now. It's kind of, you know, really fairly kind of crystal at this mm. point. Yeah, um, it's beautiful. And I do have a plate and frame filter that, that I would like to start experimenting with, but uh, 
it does depend on how aggressive you are in your right. filtration too the degree of clarity that you're looking for uh, eventually you will start scrubbing aroma compounds i mean we don't have any oils in cider so right. Uh, you're not going to kind of lose as much that way as you might. But um, it might be but, something that's lost. If yeah, you and, and it really does yeah. depend too on how, how aggressive, how many microns down you're filtering to. So I think a light filtration mm -hmm. wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing if uh, if it's going to give you kind of a, an extra level of consistency there. Because sometimes my kombucha tastes like apples. And you're I started right. convincing myself, I'm like, I wonder if apples actually have flavor. I wonder <laughs> if this is all yeast and yeast releasing flavor compounds that we're perceiving as apples, but it's yeah. not actually real. And that you could actually like make this flavor just via like yeah, a fermentation yeah. of like just honey and, 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 and yeast and like, you know, like, and the My, yeast off of like a, a wild honey. Anyway, I was kind of going yeah, out yeah. into that. Well, <laughs> acetaldehyde is kind of that fresh green apple in low, in uh, low volumes and in a higher concentration, it starts to smell more grassy. Right. Um, and, I don't know if it's the acetaldehyde that is responsible for the fresh cut fruit uh, kind of smell when you actually do cut an apple. Uh -huh. I'd heard, and uh, I probably shouldn't repeat this because I have no idea if it's true or not, <laughs> I had heard that the compounds responsible for the apple smell in a fresh apple are different than those that you get in a kind of finished cider. That would make sense. Okay, that's sort of interconnected. Right, because, because I, be I know like that, a, that, a, that kind a, of acetaldehyde, that's part of those esters that come from the yeast themselves. That's fascinating. So. Yeah, because I, I, that's why I bring it up, because if you were to strain, like somehow make a solution that gets rid of, you know, your yeast would, 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 would get through a filter, but you're, you, you know, I wonder how much um, mm -hmm. is, is being released into the solution from the stuff that we filter out. Yeah. Um, I have a, a final question for you. Um, uh, oh. We have, uh, you know, Sister Speak joins us every week. Um, is this, no, this is from Victoria. No, that's, oh, that's her. I think this is. So this is, uh, she's, um, uh, hello. Is, is this, this oh, sorry. This is, uh... <laughs> you know what? I, I'll call you right back. Sorry. Okay, bye. I thought we had our first caller there. Yeah, we totally did. Um, that was, uh, that's really funny. Um, so Sister Speak calls in every, every, every show. And uh, she's um, a part of it normally as a guest on the Google Meet. You you said you'd watch some episodes. I, I think I saw her on an yeah. episode that yeah, I watched. So I told her, her yeah. she should call in, you know. And then we have the audio of her, but that was just a, a random call. In. <laughs> I think a fellow trying to buy kegs. I'm me. surprised <laughs> nobody's wandered up to try right? to buy cider actually. So. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Um, so my my question for you, um, uh, and uh, I wonder if we can get her on. Oh, well, you know what? I'll, I'll call her after the, the show. We're basically at the end here. Um, is uh, uh, when you are. Uh, uh, creating your ferments and this might be like this is such an elementary question to end with but like I have been in my fermentation trying to get an even distribution of yeast I find that when I when I ferment and if I just don't touch it which is what I which is what I want to do I want to just not touch it when yeah, I do yeah. the fermentation but I end up having to give it a stir kind of like in sake production or something mm -hmm. like that and um, and I wonder if if that process of, 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 you know, I found that that stirring of the, the batch on day three and again on day seven of generally a 14 to 21 day fermentation, yeah. very short for kombucha, yeah. um, makes all the difference in the world for sort of, otherwise if I don't do that, I find when I go to a bottle, I rack and mm -hmm. I get a really sort of stronger bottle and mm -hmm. a much watery bottle, more watery bottle. Yeah. So again, elementary question here. That's but interesting. Like how... not, not elementary at all. I okay. think you've, you've, what you've touched on here is the rabbit hole of uh, fermentation kinetics. Okay. <laughs> okay. Which somebody, <laughs> An uh, interesting... a, a cider maker at <laughs> yeah. one of the uh, US ciders that I spoke to um, got into that a little bit. And it, it's uh, sort of this ongoing debate that um, I think is just largely down to people's personal experiences. I don't know that anyone's ever actively studied it, but there is an active debate between using cubic shaped tanks versus the cylindrical tanks, ah. and then cylindrical tanks with a conical bottom, and what effect that has on the actual movement of the solution as the yeast are fermenting. Interesting. Well, so we're bringing in a similar shape to what we used to. So we used to use these um, these uh, um, smaller um, uh, Crocs are they're like uh, they were like meant for sauerkraut. They were like made out of clay. And yeah. They were like, uh, 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 oh, there she is. Okay, I'm just gonna add her on. <laughs> hey, uh, Sherry Ann from Sister Speak. Hello. Hello. We're just we're, <laughs> we're just we're just coming to the end of the show here. But thank you for calling in. This is Kieran. Kieran, Sherry Ann. Hi, I don't know if I should wave. She's watching her <laughs> I, you're right. yeah, yeah. It's nice to, to meet you. <laughs> we, your voice. We've been, we've been having a great time uh, talking about apple cider. And we were just talking about uh, 
what was kinetics? Fer fermentation kinetics. Fermentation kinetics. That's where we're at right now. <laughs> yeah, right? So pretty, pretty <laughs> awesome. So we were just, I was just telling him that, um, that we, uh, we used to ferment in these, uh, these 10 gallon um, uh, crocks. And then we, uh, when we did that, it was always a seven day ferment. And we would almost always, six to eight days, um, we would nail our, our goal of a particular pH, particular bricks, a particular flavor profile. No stirring required, super easy. Mm -hmm. But when we scaled up to to one BBL, yeah. Suddenly, this 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 hundred and sixty liter tank, um, very different. Yeah. And uh, and we ferment in a two hundred liter tank, so we have the oxygen we because of course we're making acetic acid, right? We're right, not making right. alcohol. We're we're going for a, a an aerobic ferment. Sure. Um, and um, and yeah. That's when this started happening. That's yeah. when I had to yeah, yeah. experiment with stirring because it well, was a very different. You've got a couple of different variables that have been added in there, right? You've got because of the the square cube law, the surface area relative to the total volume of fluid is going to be different. Right. So there's that different level of, of oxygen exposure. You've yeah. also got a larger thermal mass. Right. So it's going to be more regulated against kind of the temperature shifts that you might have been getting with a smaller volume. Right. And then perhaps even like you said, the shape of the container or maybe even the material. Like when I'm using a a small glass carboy, yeah. there's not nearly as much uh, uh, oxygen penetrating through, well, there's none, compared to a plastic IBC, right, where you, you get kind of a level of oxygen permeability similar to something like oak. Right. So um, Interesting. Th okay. There's a lot, I think there's a lot going on there, and I, I hmm. haven't reached the level of consistency to be able to pull out what individual things might be having a certain effect on there, but uh, it would be nice to, to be able to... Um, to do enough experiments there to kind of separate out those different variables and see what I really want to do that. Yeah, trying to figure that out. What we to resolve it, we found that our answer is to to, to give it a stir on day three, a day on on again on day seven. Sometimes yeah. a little bit later, if it's just really tasting like the yeast hasn't developed as much where we want it to be, mm -hmm. we then uh, transfer it over to our um, a conical tank that we keep uh, uh, sealed at that point, and yeah. we chill it down to three and degrees and crash as much of these as we can for seven days. And then we uh, we blow off the yeast on day like three, day four, day five, and okay. we clean it up really nice. Yeah. And then that's uh, then we once we feel that the yeast is really removed, then we mix it one more time, and then yeah. we bottle. That's kind of our process. Right. Yeah. And well, evidently you've figured out what's working for you, which yeah. is the important part. It, yeah. It ends up being that's that's kind of the art form of the Isn't whole it? Yeah. fermentation. Trying to figure right? that out. A little yeah. bit of magic that gets sprinkled on at the end. Well, you know, I I uh, I know we're coming to the end here, but uh, Sherry Ann, uh, you joined us here at the end. Did you have one like? burning question for uh for an apple cider uh uh, uh aficionado here uh, <laughs> to, to, to yeah, right? um, I'm, I'm actually currently drinking vermont apple cider um nice. like apple juice apple juice curious, okay oh like is there any incentive to use some of the apples for a cider ferment and then some of them for as a juice i'm just curious because i i love apple cider and i love both versions i just right. um I personally can't drink alcohol, so I'm right. always trying to figure out. But yeah, but most you're, people kind of do one or the other. Is, is there incentive to do both, or do they conflict with each other? You're well, no, no. I mean, uh, you're you're uh, not the first person to ask me about that. So evidently, there is some demand and, and interest, and uh, particularly, uh, you know, a lot of the places that I go and pick from, um, there'll be families, they'll have small kids, and I'd I'd like to be able to offer something to them. So I have been inviting oh. people down on juicing day. And say, hey, nice. we've got these little, you know, two two liter plastic jugs. Come and take some and stick it in your fridge, and don't leave it too long because then you can't give it to the kids. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would I would love to do that. I mean, it's um, that's a it, idea. it's more it's definitely more valuable as a cider. But at that point, you've put a year's worth of labor into it, and the glass bottles, and all the shipping for that, and, and everything else. So so your costs do come down a lot. Um, I think it would be worthwhile just purely to to be able to cater to a more diverse demographic of people. Yeah, and then so, I would love that. I'd be so cool to go to a cider and, and like usually I'm like, do you have apple juice? And you know, and like they'll be like, no. And I'm like, oh, we're kombucha. Like maybe there's like a type of like um apple apple kombucha that could happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, maybe I could. 
Do you think I could steal some uh, cider apples from you someday and then work on a, a kombucha? When project? I when I find some, I could. Uh... Yeah. Or even just some random apples that you yeah, get from yeah. the valley. Definitely. Like, well, we we've got some of the ones we were picking the other day that that we could uh, probably part ways with. So sweet. That would be really um, cool. Maybe yeah, we could I'd experiment say... with a with a with an apple because I I've, I've had this th idea of of adding honey to make up the sugar level I need for my kombucha ferment, mm -hmm. but taking into account the residual sugars that are in the apples themselves and crushing yeah. them just a little bit, and then borrowing the idea of, um, of uh, Sandar cats and just leaving the fruit in the ferment to get like yeah, everything, yeah. and then wreck, wreck oh. that off. So I sacrifice sure. a scoby, but yeah, I'd be yeah. able to produce something that might be really interesting. Well, you could also try, depending on the characteristics you want, because apples uh, apples do have a small amount of a non-fermentable sugar, sorbitol, in them, oh. but pears have much, much more. Interesting. So if you were to use pears, uh, and you had a higher amount of sorbitol in there, mm. if you did finish the fermentation and went totally dry, you would end up with a bit more residual sweetness from the, the sorbitol. That would be very cool. So, so pears, maybe that's oh. one of the secrets for why perry tastes so good, eh? That's definitely part of it, yeah, yeah. But you have to be careful because, and I'm, I don't want to get us too off into the weeds right before we end here, yeah. but the, the difference between a peri pear and an eating pear is greater than the difference between a cider apple and an eating apple. Oh, interesting. Okay. I, I think the, the statistic or the number that I heard is down to the tannin, a, a eating pear might have something like 300 parts per million of tannin, a peri pear is going to have two thousand. Oh my goodness! Okay, so so, so quite uh, almost uh, ten times the amount of. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Cool. Okay. Well, um, uh, some final uh, words here, I guess. Uh, we're we're at the end of the show here. Um, where can our viewers uh, uh, find you and 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 uh, any. Yeah. I guess thoughts on, on the show or final? Well, it was a pleasure uh, to be your guest. Thanks for, for Thank coming you. up here. And uh, we're going to maybe do a little bit of a, a tasting uh, sensory analysis after this. So we've got Excited. more to look forward to. But yeah. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, and uh, it's always great talking to another fermenter, um, especially one as knowledgeable as yourself. Because <laughs> I find we, we all get into our kind of little focused uh, sort of uh, yeah pathways and we, we don't get out as much as we should and it's uh, it can be really kind of reinvigorating to talk to some other people who are really passionate about it. So. I, I feel that. I feel very much uh, inspired by the conversation. <laughs> I've been really, really enjoying this talk and, and uh, learning people, a lot uh, from, uh, I, I, it makes me want to study um, uh, a little bit more about the compounds of flavor mm. if, uh, and, and understand that a little bit more easily. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I get... likewise, I, I have no background in chemistry, so I, I would really love to learn more about that. <laughs> okay. But uh... I didn't come across that way. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay. So, uh, um, uh, just uh, finishing off, people can find us at uh, the website is sort of where everything lives. So that's affinitycider.com. There's the shop. You can place an order through there. It's all. Uh, pick up only at the moment, um, but uh, you can place an order whenever. Pick up is Saturdays and Sundays from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Any time in that window is fine. Or if you want to pick up outside of that time, uh, just add a little note to your order and we'll we'll work something out. We can be flexible. And you can find us on Instagram at Affinity Cider House uh, and Facebook.com slash Affinity Cider House. Awesome. And Great. sign up to the mailing list because yeah. we've got uh, lots of cool news coming. You can get in early access to the future releases. Nice. Nice. Cool. Yeah. And, and ex exciting stuff happening. So, and, and Sister Speak too. Uh, Sherry Ann uh, does a show. Um, you want to tell the viewers uh, where they can see your show? Sure. Uh, Patreon.com slash Sister Speak or uh, check out the music at sisterspeakmusic.com. Awesome. I'm just walking up a hill while drinking apple cider right now. So Ver Vermont apple cider. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us at the end here, and uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to next week's show too. We should have some really interesting stuff happening then. Um, in two weeks' time, we'll actually have one of the writers of my favorite tea book, um, uh, History, Terroirs, and Varieties, um, the, the the Camellia Sinensis Tea House, um, will be joining us cool. uh, in a couple weeks. That's going to be super fun. Um, I'm trying. This isn't a promise. I'm trying next week uh, to get these herbal tea farmers that I've wanted on the show forever. That should be really, really fun. Um, and uh, really appreciate your time today. Um, uh, you can find Jagasilk, uh, jagasilk.com. You can follow us on Instagram at Instagram, uh, at Jagasilk. And you can also um, go to our web store and buy some kombucha if you're interested in our fermentations. Um, we actually do a 12 pack we get. Uh, it's just a little bit easier to ship. But, oh, know, cool. And it was just like a minimum. You've got to do the 12 pack and then that can go through Canada Post. And then it's actually it's won't well, break and all that fun stuff. I don't know what the legalities are of that and right. cider, but anyway, <laughs> throwing that out there. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you so much uh, for watching. 
We'll catch you next week, um, Thursdays at 1 o'clock. Always, you can watch our uh, archive shows, uh, youtube.com slash jagasilk. Um, check things out there. We're on episode 75, so there's tons of these wonderful conversations with amazing business owners, general managers, fermenters, farmers, um, and I really encourage you to check it out. So hit the subscribe button um, on the bottom there, and if you click the bell, then when uh, we go live, you'll be notified. Thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day, and thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank My you, pleasure. Sister Speak, too. <laughs> okay. Thank you both. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. Okay. And okay. Oh, you need one of these? Okay, I can do that. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you.